Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the first storyteller of the evening, Breakups and Downs and Through, Mr. Tim Ellerby. So there I was, 19 years old, working in a coffee shop, when a 60-something woman comes in and offers me some advice. As I gave her her change, she says, you know, young man, you got great customer service skills, great people skills, and you also have dashing good looks. Do you have a girlfriend or a wife? Now I'm wondering where this is going because it's not in my job description to date customers, especially senior citizens. <laughs> so I say, uh, no, I'm not hooked up with anybody. I'm not married. I'm not dating anybody. And she seems disturbed by this, and she goes, well, I'll tell you what. If you ever decide to get married, and I take a step back, You want to date and marry your best friend, because then you'll be happy. So as she goes on her way, I consider what she says, and I also ponder my newly discovered dashing good looks. <laughs> now, at this point in life, my best female friend was a nice young woman from Miami, Florida, who I'd met through a contemporary Christian magazine called Contemporary Christian Music. And they encouraged pen pals between readers of the magazine. So I'm thinking to myself, OK, we share the same Christian faith. We get along great. We've been pen paling for like three and a half years or so. And she's also got the most amazing curves I've uh, yet experienced in life. So I'm thinking I hit the jackpot, right? So I run this by her, and she goes, sure, we can start dating. We can become a couple. That'll be great. So for the next three years, I proceeded to court her with abandon, treated her like she was the only woman on the planet Earth. Fly back and forth to Miami to see her, took her out on dates, met her family, charmed their socks off. <laughs> her sisters were like, girl, you better keep this one. You done hit the jackpot. So we move, well, she moves here, and we get married. And everything's great for the first two years. We have, again, everything in common. We like the same books, the same teachers, the same movies, the same music. In fact, the only flaw she seems to have is she thinks Star Trek is better than Star Wars, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> So because I'm a budding musician at the time, I tend to write her songs. And I wrote several of them and recorded them in my studio with titles such as I Do Love You and Close to You. And she seems really happy with the songs. Every time I'd write one, I would, you know, here, honey, you need to listen to this. And she goes, oh, Tim, you know just what to say. So I'm thinking, great, you know, she likes my talent. And little did I know, she did have an ulterior motive. Now, I had two jobs at the time. I was still working at the coffee shop, and I was also working at a bookstore. But I wanted to be a rock star. Her intent was for me to just work at the bookstore and the coffee shop. Honey, you need to give up that dream of music and focus on the real jobs. And I say, well, I'm trying to build something, a career, so I will never have to work for anyone or be fired or written up again for being one minute late. <laughs> well, that's a pipe dream. You should just let it go. So because I was immaturely enamored of her significant posterior. <laughs> I figured the right thing to do as a husband would be to do what she wanted, which would make her happy. So I did for a time, but I became pretty bored with that. 
really quickly. Now along the way, I noticed a strange change. She started withdrawing from me on an intimate level. And at first I thought it was because she had uh, a hard day at work and maybe her feet were hurting her and I was like, baby, would you like me to massage your feet? No, I'm good, I'm good. And the next day I would run her a hot bath and light candles and put on a smooth jazz and you need a massage? I'm, I'm here, I can do this. No, I don't want that. In fact, you should stop asking because it seems to me that all you ever want from me is sex. So I'm like, okay. This goes on for several years and as each year progresses, we become less and less intimate until we're dying down to less than 12 times a year. So I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm a fairly new husband. I figured I need some sort of release. So I would start watching pornography. And she didn't like that. She made such a big fuss about it that I was like, OK, all right, all right, I'll stop. So I did. And I needed something else to do, some way to get some sort of release. So a friend of mine asked me if I wouldn't mind auditioning for Enchantment. They needed a keyboard player. Now, I want to be a rock star, mind you. Van Halen, Big Country, Metallica. I don't want to do any R&B. But my friend says, come on, it'll be fun. They, they tour, they go out, and they have a lot of fun. I'm like, OK, I'll take the audition. So I went to the audition. I nailed the job. And we were doing like four or five concerts per month. And it was really fun. So for a time, I forgot that I was not having intimate time with my wife. By then, I was at Kmart headquarters. And I loved my job. I loved going out with the band. I would come home, throw tons of money on the bed, and like, you know, great, there you go. And that was fine. She spent the money. <laughs> she bought herself a lot of things. Seemed to be elated that I was no longer asking her for sex. So I was like, hmm, what do I do now? So about 11 years into our marriage, our first child was born. He was followed three years later by the second. I know exactly when each of them were conceived because they were the only times we had sex in their respective years. <laughs> So when the first child was born, she had a really big problem with him crying all the time. So I'm an hour away at Kmart headquarters taking customer complaints, yay. <laughs> and she calls through the emergency line and the boss comes to get me and I'm like, hello, what's going on, the house on fire? No, the house is not on fire. If you don't come get this child, I'm going to throw him down the basement steps. So this first time she mentioned this, I. It brought dread to me because I'm, again, an hour away by bus. And you know, the buses in Detroit are not the most reliable. So for that week, I kept having to go home. And uh, I discovered really quickly that postpartum depression was a real problem, among some others. And I read up on it and did some research. And I learned how to better manage her and manage the home, leaving the baby with relatives and such while I was at work. But again, because I was always being called away, my boss couldn't keep my job for long. So one day he calls me into his office and says, Tim, we can no longer keep your job. Now, this made me upset because I like my Kmart job. It was easy. <laughs> uh, so there I was with no job, a couple of concert gigs on the weekends, and a spouse who wasn't interested in her children or her husband. I became a house husband, and I hated it. Now, I still took care of her because I loved her. She would come home from work from her hospital job, and I would have dinner ready. Children would be in the bed. Lights would be down low. She can come in and relax, no chaos. 
And I'm thinking, you know, maybe things will turn around. But they didn't. And after about three or so years additionally of this, I gave up trying to initiate. And she comes to me one day and says, you know what, I can't do this anymore. She says, and I quote, I'm blessed and highly favored. I don't need you. You can go. So I moved in with my sister. And I stayed in my room for a month, coming out only for necessity. And I usually get back from depression really easy because I'm a happy-go-lucky person. Life is full of joy, but not for that month. My sister was very concerned. She would come to me, you know, you all right, bro? You want to go check out a movie or something? No, I'm fine. Just let me be. I'll be, I'll be good. I'll be out when I'm ready. I prayed a lot that month. I sought God to find out what I should do. And his answer seemed distant and far away. Tim, you need to go back to church. And I'm like, well, Lord, I understand that, but I'm still dealing with this pain. Well, never mind that. Go fellowship. You'll get what you need there. I don't think so, Lord. So I gave up going to church, and eventually I stopped praying. And toward the end of the month, I was in such a dark place, I didn't even recognize myself. And she shows up one day, and she has the, the children, and she has divorce papers. And she says, this is it, I can't take them anymore, here's your papers, sign them, we're good. Okay, so I have to get up now. I take care of my children. We go through the divorce. I get a job, I excel at it, I get promoted really quickly. And we move out to uh, an apartment down by the riverfront, and just me and my two children, I have full custody awarded because she didn't show up for the custody hearings. And we, we decide we're just gonna be a house full of Ellerby boys. <clears throat> and so we did, we watched TV and played video games and went to movies and played video games rode our bikes and played video games. And it was a lot of fun. Now, believe it or not, the same thing happened to me again. At the age of 39, I married a woman. We got along great. We were introduced by a friend. And I thought, oh, wow, the last time wasn't so good. I told her everything that happened. And she was like, great, that'll never happen to you if you're with me. So I'm like, okay, it's a good idea, yeah. <laughs> so we, we got married, and I put a ring on her for finger. I remember doing that. And as soon as it went cha-ching, <laughs> she goes, okay, uh, enough of this playing around, take off the mask. I'm going to work and school and church. And I'm like, wait a whoa, whoa. <laughs> We're newlyweds, we need time together. Oh, there'll be plenty of time for that after I'm done with work, school, and church. So I'm like, you're kidding me, right? So I went through this for a year, and then I'm like, mm-mm. Because the first marriage was 17 years. I'm not about to do this in 17 years. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but because I was brought up, really, not to divorce, but to work things out, I tried that. We went to counselors and our pastor, and ultimately nothing worked, and we ended up separating. She separated about four years in. And I wasn't depressed this time, but I became creative. <laughs> and in one year, I wrote seven books and recorded four CDs. <clears throat> and I was happy to get all of that out, you know, all that, you know, because I need to do something. And I understand why she was like that. It was something in her that said that men only wanted her for her body, and she didn't understand the love that I was offering to her was genuine love. It was not meant to, to harm or hurt. We divorced a year after the separation. Eight or so months went by. We became friends again. It was good. Didn't have a problem with that. 
And to this day, we get along. And I actually get along with both of them. Um, I do believe in love. I still do. Not so much the fairy tale thing. I'm a little bit old for that. You know, the oh, white picket fence family, you know, two kids, three and a half cats. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I, I believe that then. Now it's more about getting to know um, a potential mate, just in case I get married again, which I'm not thinking about that so much now, but maybe at a later date. So it's just me and my children, and I'm building a legacy so I can give to them. And at some point, I will consider romance again, but I'll have different criteria. No more of this, ooh, that's nice and round. <laughs> and more of the seven month audition process. <laughs> so seriously, I, um, I believe in love, like I said, and I'm gonna do everything that I can moving forward to make sure that when I'm ready, I'll be exactly the man she needs and I'll make sure I, on the interaction that she's the woman that I need. Tim Ellerby.